Um, now we will start into second part of our data-driven storytelling and we will transit from data visualization into a bit of data illustration. I will be your host. Uh, I'm Sara Kochevar, a PhD student at the University of Uvascula, and I study fishing-induced evolution here, uh, food web and populational impacts of it. Um, I have no professional uh, artistic background. I'm just fascinated by complexities, which you can actually simplify, so sort of encapsulate into simplicity. And this ranges from food web theory to uh, functional design or clean data plots. Um, so the research for simplicity is actually what has led me to start illustrating my research. And at this part of workshop is actually, ex especially for those who want to know more about what graphical abstracts are or are feeling perhaps overwhelmed of how to illustrate one. And my main goal is so to show you a um, very simple way of creating your own icons and visually summarizing your own findings. Um, so our agenda if this will move, uh, is over here. Um, we want first, we will go through some uh, basics uh, of how to create a graphical abstract. Um, then in the second part, we will try to um, actually visualize uh, our findings from the first part. And then we will have a short coffee break after which we will resume for additional freeform icon drawing. And during this time, you will actually have a chance to draw on your own um, study organisms or perhaps some processes, or it can be whatever you want to uh, visualize. Um, or as well, you can follow me along uh, and do what I'm doing. Um, and after that, we will um, actually have some time for individual drawing time, um, during which uh, I would like you to work um, more on your own icons and think about how to visualize your story, perhaps of some abstract that you are currently working on, or perhaps some research that you are actually presenting at Oikos meeting. Um, it can be also made up story, it really doesn't matter. The most important thing is that you transform or try to transform your idea and your narrative visually. Yes, and then we will create uh, random breakout rooms and there you will have opportunity to share your visuals uh, with others and get some feedback. So let's dive in. Um, our story, uh, begins with information overload and growing shortage of data storage. Most of world's data has been created in the last few years and it seems that there is really no sign of slowing down. In fact, the predictions are that uh, the world's data is supposed to grow to 175 zettabytes uh, by 2025. Just to put this number into perspective, 175 zettabytes uh, presents approximately as much information as there are cells in the thirds of uh, current global population. So as many cells as all the human bodies of two thirds of global population have so much of data, which is quite in inimaginable. Yeah, and science is also fascinating because it is actually facing new challenges in this era of data overload. Every year, over 30,000 of peer-reviewed English language journals is collectively publishing more than 3 million papers, which means that on average, more than 8,000 articles is published each day. The growth of both the number of new journals and the number of articles seems to be actually even accelerating. So these numbers, of course, leads to slight conflict since on average a researcher reads 
not only, but about 250 articles each year. And this brings us to visuals. Why visuals? Well, social media and searching engines have become more important than ever before. Um, I guess we found out this during present years. Um, but besides, visuals offer you, I mean, your potential reader also information, message or narrative in a format that is very quickly understood and easily consumed, shareable, and most importantly, more memorable. We don't have necessarily enough of time to read 100 abstracts of 250 words every day, uh, but we might have enough of time uh, to actually check 100 images. So our brain can process images much faster than text. And one of the reasons for that is that the information that we perceive through visual comes directly at once, while the text needs to be processed in sort of um, linear manner. And therefore, the answer are graphical abstracts. Uh, graphical abstracts can define um, actually your message in a short, concise illustration. Uh, that is graphical abstract. And um, it can make the article more engaging and can very quickly communicate the main domain findings or the purpose of the paper. Plus it can actually increase the probability that your paper will be noticed or seen. Um, because for example, if someone wants to Google uh, for particular keywords that you actually have in your very own paper, uh, then it's extremely likely that the graphical abstract will be uh, one of the top results uh, in the image search of the same keywords. So also nowadays, of course, there are many publishers that are already offering the possibility for you to submit graphical abstracts. However, the idea is not new. Uh, scientists have been using visuals to communicate their research uh, since very beginnings of science. Um, there were and there are many talented illustrators, photographers, uh, and nowadays also designers. And here we have Ernst Haeckel, uh, who was evolutionist and zoologist that at some point even considered to pursue science, uh, not science, <laughs> art as career. He went for science, um, but although he chose science on its own, he actually kept intertwining the two and actually he created extremely prolific artistic work, which you can see uh, in the latest fashion. It has like around 450 prints of just hackers um, illustrations. All right. so. You finished your research, experiments are done, everything is statistically significant, and data is plotted, and the manuscript looks just gorgeous, so you're ready for the submission. But you want to increase your outreach, and perhaps you decide to go for graphical abstracts. So where to begin, and what should we take care of? Um, here I combined a kind of checklist that could be helpful. And we will briefly go through each of these points. I'm sure that there are some other things that we could still uh, add to the checklist. Um, so if you want to add something, feel free to just put it to the chat. First, uh, it's good to just sit down and brainstorm for a bit and uh, just spill all the ideas that you have on one piece of paper. Um, bear in mind that we need to create a visual presentation of the main message or even narrative for our paper. So I say narrative because you don't just want to sketch every single, I mean, all the things that you already mentioned in the actual abstract, but you rather want to um, have the graphical abstract as the attracting part of your research as something that is conveying your idea and perhaps engaging readers who could maybe skip the abstract or the paper if they wouldn't actually see the visuals. So think of the main message that we wish to 
reader to know. So like, what are the most important characters of the story? What are the main processes or changes, observations that are taking place? Um, you might want to think of questions uh, like when, who, where, why, and this answer could be sketched then. However, you don't want to really answer each of these questions because then your graphical abstract would be just way overcrowded. Um, but you can start doing some sketches, perhaps on a piece of paper, computer, iPad, whatever works best for you. I like to um, just do sketches usually on a piece of paper. And once I'm satisfied with my composition or some idea, I would just take a picture of it and upload it to PowerPoint and then start drawing. Um, yeah. So the next thing that we can also think of is style. Um, it is actually the fun part of graphical abstract. And you want to find your own voice or your own style and share it without compromising the take home message. So this should remain clear from the graphical abstract. Other than that, you can actually express your idea on whichever way you would like. Um, there are no, I mean, there are some restrictions or recommendations that usually journals have, but this is only mostly only about layout and format and pixels. Other than that, sky's the limit. So graphical abstract can be uh, perhaps more serious and some also include some uh, plots there. Uh, it can work, perhaps uh, it is like, yeah, perhaps it works well, perhaps not. Uh, or they, they can be also fun. Uh, so on the right, we have graphical abstract in comic style that is actually from our research group. And in the paper, we introduce a distributed computational environment uh, of shortly uh, DICE, which is a software that can run multifactorial simulations across all the available central processing units and even separate hardware components. Uh, the components can then communicate and simulate, simultaneously tackle the code and execute each order. So actually, this software is extremely useful for different researchers across different disciplines, uh, actually for anyone who needs to run their code in R more than twice. So basically, we have a really good tool that we needed to advertise to as wide audience as possible. So for that reason, we decided to go for graphical abstract and sort of really dumb out, I mean, dumb down, or how to say that? Yeah, <laughs> dumb the idea, like to make it extremely simple as much as possible. Of course, then we have also here some infographic, which we introduce it in uh, the actual manual when our reader really wants to find out more about the program. So yeah, this is style. Uh, think about, you can, use styling to your advantage. And yeah, when usually when I start drawing, uh, I always create all the icons, all the main players in the story, and then sort of just start uh, laying them around and putting them in, in some order or trying to tell the story with them. Um, this brings us now to layout. What is layout? Uh, it is actually quite important because it's your base uh, that will determine how you distribute your icons. So you can think of layout as setting a scene for your story. Is there going to be a one scene? Are there going to be two parallel scenes? Uh, are we going to compare them? Or perhaps there are two scenes uh, that need a transitional segment. Um, we can also have main segment that is leading to different findings or perhaps alternative scenes. So layout can pretty much uh, set the stage. Yeah, next one is information flow. Um, information flow goes within the layout. So here we indicate our reader where the eyes should look at first and where they should exit, where should they look at last. So we kind of guide them through all the story. So information flow introduces sort of 
dynamic and organizes the reading direction, but it can, for example, if we want to visualize the process of some process of something that is like progressing in a linear manner, um, then we want to have a linear information flow, uh, whether left to right or top to bottom. Um, if we process, I mean, if the process has several steps, you can also distribute them in two lines and lead the eyes in sort of zigzag manner. Or if you are talking about some life cycle or uh, an experiment that starts and hopefully not, but perhaps ends in the same place, <laughs> you want to use a circular um, arrow. So, and then another way is also when you have, of course, different results, uh, you can also, you know, sort of, uh, show your alternative findings in parallel organization. Uh, yeah. Then we have color. Color is a uh, second language because there is whole science and vocabulary behind colors. So their origin, physics, how to perceive them. Um, with graphic abstract, we want to additionally stimulate the photoreceptor cells. And for that, it's good to pick proper colors. For example, if we can emphasize the progress or stagnation of icon or a process, uh, we can use increasing or decreasing brightness of certain color. Or if we want to highlight or pinpoint a specific element or icon, then perhaps we should use less color on other elements and focus more on, the, on something that is actually worth pointing out. Um, contrasting colors are really cool because they are useful for indicating the differences uh, or disparities between two elements that are actually having more or less similar importance. Um, we can also use then color psychology into our advantage and because we often associate colors and meanings uh, with particular emotions, uh, of course, there can be some cultural differences, but um, yeah, well, red and green are pretty much problem solution. Uh, although perhaps marine biologists would disagree and say blue is the solution. Mm. Yeah, this is about colors, but I will show you some more tricks about colors uh, during the steps when we actually start drawing. So here are also scales. Once you select colors, uh, it's good to test their accessibility to others. So, and also like uh, if someone, um, I mean, prints the black and white version, you want to check your colors, how do they look in grayscale? And there are a few options how to do so. You can actually uh, save the colors as an image uh, or, just take, um, or just take a screenshot and then import it inside of your PowerPoint. Uh, and then you just can go to picture format and then to color. And over here, recolor, you will have grayscale. So you can just check it out how it looks like. These colors, I mean, we wouldn't want to use these two mm. together probably, but Perhaps even yes, it depends on how, uh, what are they portraying? So how important is the thing that they are portraying? Probably, uh, yeah, it depends on what exactly you want the reader to see. Um, and if you're a Mac user, uh, you can actually do that much quicker uh, just by going to um, your settings over here. Uh, and then system preferences, and then you can just check um, color display. Uh, you can change it to grayscale. And I, if I do that now, you won't see any difference. So for that reason, uh, yeah, I will just set it as it is. Then you can evaluate actually whether we should add more or less brightness, adjust some tint, saturation, or make it warmer. Um, so yeah, scales. Next are arrows. Arrows uh, can really help us emphasize the information flow. So we can also use them to signal a new direction or show some exception or just want to stress the relation between parallel findings. Uh, you will find arrows if you go to um, insert, uh, 
and then to shapes and over here plenty of arrows and let's just click on one let's if we make one arrow for example uh, then we can go to format pane and over here we have opportunity to change the arrow type for example we can change the begin arrow type so the first part or we can change the last one and of course you can play with different with many more things and use your arrows to um, actually to your advantage like if there is some process that is the main one you can maybe have full line while if something is alternative uh, reaction or something uh, you can perhaps use some dash line um, they can be actually very helpful where are we okay we are at text uh, text can be also part of graphical abstract. Clearly, uh, CCC could stand for Caribbean Conservation Corporation, or in our case, con conciseness, categories, and consistency. Um, well, we want to condense text to minimum and rather keep the visuals to speak for themselves. Uh, it works best to steal it down to few keywords or key numbers um, with most crucial short comments, if necessary. Uh, font should also be easily readable and fit the style of the graphical abstract. For example, if the style is comic, font can be comic too. Um, there are actually three basic font categories, uh, serif, sans serif, and script. Uh, serif font is one that has extra tails, and you all know Times New Roman. Uh, then we have sans serif, which are without these extra pieces and are actually much more easy to read. These are Avenir, Calibri, uh, the information flow, go I mean, yeah, our perception, uh, reading speed gets uh, actually enhanced. Um, then we also have script font, uh, which is one that mimics actual writing, like Vivaldi. Um, well, yeah. <laughs> It is a bit much, <laughs> but yeah, so use keywords, use buzzwords. Um, and then here we have shadow. Uh, I don't know if you saw the difference, probably a bit, yes. Uh, shadow, uh, the main purpose of shadow is to create an illusion of three dimensionality uh, or to actually define and highlight uh, your illustration because we often use wide background. So just a bit of shadow will add slightly more contrast uh, so that your image can actually pops up. Uh, you can also create a shadow with solid color to have more sharper shadow or with linear or radial gradient to have it a bit softer. And these are also all adjustable in a format shape pen. Uh, we will look at that once we start drawing. Yes, so graphical abstracts, they, um, they can take quite a lot of time to make, uh, but they are extremely recyclable. So all the hours spent on visualizing the leading findings can really pay off because you can use graphical abstract, uh, not just for journal purposes, but also like grant applications, journal clubs, animations, GIFs. Uh, maybe turning icon to project logo or to make your lecture more interesting and easier to follow. So, the, I mean, yeah, they take a while, but they can be quite reusable. Um, this is my fisheries induced evolution. Uh, just, I want to share, show you. Uh, ah, yeah, yeah, like this, everyone wants to listen to the story, right? <laughs> It's much more hypnotizing, uh, but yeah, they can be pretty cool. And actually now we will just check, uh, oops, yeah. We will just compare abstract text uh, towards graphical abstract. So um, we will look three examples and I think your eyes are al already probably uh, centered on the graphical abstract. And this is how they might look once they are printed in PDF version. Uh, but let's see text against graphical abstract, the comparison of the two. All right, so here we have um, first one. 
before even looking so like if you think if you look at your own graphical abstract uh, the best way to really um, find out what you need to draw is to just search for the main keywords and usually most often these are already in your title uh, like for example here we see governance stakeholders seagrass services uh, seagrass ecosystem social aspects stakeholders well-being governance these are actually all drawn they are all having their own icons and then we have some very um, important uh, verbs let's say although in this sense a noun like links it tells us that something is interlinked so probably there will be some room for arrows right mm -hmm. um, then we think how we have causes and consequences so probably everything we want to look into a holistic aspect um, and actually show this content, content and more emphasize the circularity of it or two dimensional information flow, whether with arrows or with actual um, layout. Um, I think you will find these kind of words also in your abstracts for sure. Then second example, we have um, before reading the title think for a second what could this paper be about like the layout and colors tells us that authors were comparing something in this case diversity estimates of all related species text um, is still kept to the minimum, but the most necessary keywords are here. So as well as the names of species are actually here, plus the arrows additionally guide us like where to look, um, like what comes from which. So uh, here, for example, critically endangered khaki to its reference genomes. So the key players for which they draw the icons are basically only five, if you think. Uh, four different birds and then let's say a genome although this is a symbol that you can I mean yes and so it's really kept to the minimum and one thing that I like the most about this abstract is that it has lots of white space because you want your eyes to rest I mean not to rest but like you know you want the information to come through and if you have way overcrowded everything um, the most important things will get lost. <laughs> okay, let's look at the last one. Mm. The layout of a panel by panel tells us that two scenarios were tested and compared. Um, the icons are very diverse and most of them seems to be feeding so not for portraying a singular species uh, therefore probably we have some process right uh, i would remove the flying birds here they don't seem to feed i mean first of all they are they're black they're not feeding here on microphytes uh, yeah i would just take them out i think they are not necessary uh, and really it's good to keep everything uh, to the minimum uh, they also have two letters, A and B in the corner, but this might be actually quite irrelevant in this case because there is no text. So I'm not sure why A needs to be there, why B is there. If I want to find out, I mean, on one hand, it's okay because perhaps this, they want to invite the reader to go and read the paper to find out why what A and B are presenting, but uh, I'm not sure if they're really necessary. Um, yeah, so the magnifying trick actually that they use, this one works really good. I mean, it adds a bit of contrast, it adds a bit of dimensionality. It's, mm -hmm. it's really nice so this and is interesting. Maybe birds indicate the season? Sorry? Maybe birds indicate the season? In what season? The season of like when it was happening. Ah, that's so good. I couldn't think of that. It could be, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It could be. I'm not sure. Yeah. Probably I should read the paper. <laughs> <laughs> but the point being, it wasn't intuitive. Yeah, it wasn't intuitive, no. And then A and B, it's just like, yeah, I don't know. 
Yeah, but it could be definitely, yeah. Oh, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, that, that would be it for the intro. And now I would actually, um, I, you probably wonder where to find all the icons. Uh, at this moment, I would actually invite you to open the PowerPoint templates uh, called Graphical Abstracts that we uploaded to SharePoint of Oikos workshop. We will uh, send you a link now in, uh, uh, in the chat. And meanwhile, so open the link uh, and just download Graphical Abstracts. Uh, it's the stage ready for us to start drawing. <laughs> 